everyone to have you all here uh, from Climate for just the opinion. in Colombia regarding the emergence and the end of climate. To begin, just uh, I'd like to give you a few words about GHRD. GHRD, Global Human Rights Defense, is a Dutch-based uh, NGO, human rights NGO, whose focus is on educating and spreading awareness about international human rights in general. So, uh, now I'd like, my name is João, I'm the coordinator of the International Justice and Human Rights team. Uh, here we have Patricio, uh, Tr Patricio Trincado, he's one of my interns, he's working with me on uh, the Inter-American System uh, issues. And we have also Amanda Rossini, who is the representative of Latino for, uh, Latinas for Climate. And now I would like to uh, invite Amanda to, to the floor. Uh, Amanda will uh, answer a few questions about the emergence of climate change and the responsibilities of states in regards to this uh, subject. Yourself for us about your background and, all, uh, and also about your participation in the, in the movement of Latino, Latinas for Climate. Thank you. Thank you, João, and hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to meet with you guys, João and Patricio, uh, and be able to collaborate with your organization, Global Human Rights Defense. I'm here representing Latinos for Climate. We are an international network in Latin America that seeks to contribute to the fight for intersectional climate justice, social justice, especially from the global south, and increase the role of women and in all their diversity and sexual gender spectrum in this cause through the visibility of eco-feminist perspective, education, empowerment on the climate crisis, and the development of projects that generate awareness and change in diverse communities, especially in the global south. Uh, Latinos for Climate was created in August 2020 by, by nine Latin American activists activists during the regional youth-led campaign for the Escazú Agreement. In 2021, we received a new group of activists uh, with whom together we have formed the organization as it is today. Personally, my name is Amanda Rossini Martins, as Ron said. I'm a Brazilian lawyer, activist, researcher in the field of human rights and forced migration. I uh, specialize in digital law and I'm currently a student in environmental and urban law postgraduate studies. And last but not least, I'm very glad to be one of the coordinators of Latinos for Climate nowadays, and I'm, and, and I'm very glad to be able to represent the organization in this interview. And I hope our contribution becomes valuable somehow. Yeah, super exciting, super interesting, Amanda. Thanks a lot for being here today. Thanks for dedicating your time to share your background and Latinos for Climate background with us for a few minutes. And now let's jump to the questions, guys. So firstly, Amanda, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your opinion or Latina, Latina for Climate's opinion on what is the relationship between the protection of human rights and the preservation of the environment in your opinion? And why do you think the recognition of the human rights to a healthy environment by the UN, UN uh, General Assembly may improve this correlation? Okay, so the link between human rights and the protection of the environment may seem pretty obvious for most of us who are already engaged in the movement of climate and social justice. Uh, however, this topic for us Latinos for, Cl for Climate continues to be one of the most important ones to be highlighted and fully understood in the context of climate justice. And therefore is where we should begin when it comes to raising awareness for our current climate crisis. This is to say that this, is, this will probably be one of my longest <laughs> answers for the interview, but let's, let's go to it. Basically, uh, the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, as it was mentioned in the question itself by João, was finally recognized by the United Nations General Assembly last year as a human right, and a right for all, not just a privilege for some. But the relationship between a safe environment and the, and the protection of human rights 
has been highlighted several times before in the last few decades in the context of addressing climate change. Even in the Paris Agreement, we can see in 2015, our first ever legally universal binding global climate change agreement, we have the acknowledgement that climate change is a common concern of all humankind. And therefore, states should respect, promote, and consider their respective obligations on human rights when taking action uh, addressing climate change. In other words, our perspective is that the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is also logically linked to the other rights and parts of already existing international human rights law. Actually, since principle one of the 19, 1972 Stockholm Declaration, it has been established already that the human being has the right to enjoy adequate living conditions in a quality environment that allows him or her to lead a dignified life. In turn, uh, in turn the Organization of the American States General, General Assembly in 2001 has underscored the importance of studying the link that may exist between the environment and human rights, recognizing the need to promote environmental protection and the effective enjoyment of all human rights. Furthermore, according to the General Comment 36 of the Human Rights Committee, stated in 2019, the right to dignified living or the right to live life with dignity implies that states must take appropriate measures to address general conditions that threaten this right, such as environmental degradation in this case. Equally, the right to a dignified life encompasses the right of individuals to access essential goods and services, such as food, water, shelter, healthcare, electricity, basic sanitation, and this was already recognized by the mentioned general comment as well. In this context, we have to consider that climate crisis is one of the greatest, if not the greatest risks that humanity faces today. Therefore, uh, the link between the crisis and the access to a dignified life and essential conditions for this life is undeniable nowadays. During uh, during a UN Council's uh, during a UN Security Council's high level open debate on climate and security in 2021, uh, it was declared by specialists that the climate change is the biggest threat to security that modern humans have ever faced. We know today that climate change has already contributed to several environmental disasters such as heat waves that kill thousands of people, storms that contaminated water supplies, the spread of infectious diseases such as malaria, for example. And according to the World Health Organization, between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year, which is a lot. <laughs> In the same way, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the famous IPCC, um, climate change has already begun to generate adverse impacts around the world, including loss of ecosystems, reduced food security, increased migration and displacement, affecting human rights in general, and increasing inequality. Thus, there is no doubt about the interrelationship between the protection of the right to an ecologically balanced environment and therefore also a fundamental right to a stable and secure climate and the essential human right to live with dignity. And so there is an, there is an undeniable link between these two. We have to consider that humankind is indivisible in this sense. So human rights are considered universal, inalienable, interrelated, interdependent, and mutually reinforcing as well. The protection of human rights uh, in the world arises from the simplicity of existing as a, hum as a human being 
in this world, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, age, sexual orientation, nationality, social group, or political opinion. For that reason alone, the protection of human rights contemplates the challenge of crossing physical, social, and political barriers, often invisible, that separate us as humanity. Therefore, we, as Latinas for Climate, firmly believe that the recognition of the human right to a healthy environment by the General Assembly, as mentioned by, Ju by João, will contribute immensely to cross some of those barriers, those existing barriers we face regarding international environmental law, and especially to the elaboration of future legally binding instruments, which will allow more effectiveness when it comes to accountability and compliance by the states. It will reinforce the accountability of states and private parties when it comes to the human rights violated, like the right to a dignified life, as it, as it was mentioned, in consequence of a conduct or omission by states that damages the environment, that lacks to prevent its conservation, and lacks to prevent climate change in general. Still regarding the recognition made by the General Assembly of the right to a healthy environment, we as Latinas for Climate believe that there is equally that it is equally important in terms of raising awareness and promoting the access to valid and legitimate information on the climate crisis. In terms that, especially when it comes to tackle greenwashing, for example, and climate disinformation. In this sense, we, we would like to inform that in a survey conducted in different countries by the organization Climate Action Against Disinformation with about 10,000 individuals, India and Brazil were respectively the countries that most believed in erroneous beliefs about climate change. The most common belief among the people was that India and Brazil were the global leaders in climate action, which was proven to be a lie, especially after our, our last few years in, of governance in Brazil. Uh, we believe that the right to access information in this case on climate change and therefore be able to actively participate in the decision-making processes is essential and the recognition made by the General Assembly legitimizes that somehow. We as Latinos for Climate would like to underscore the evolutionary character of human rights and the need for legal concepts to adapt, to be adapted to social and environmental realities like our current climate crisis, our current emergency uh, climate crisis without the pretension of being excessive formal, uh, formal about this, since the primary function of international monitoring systems is the protection of human rights and therefore of the environment as well. At last, we would like to add that we are big enthusiasts of the concept of more than human rights, uh, a concept created in a project by the uh, UN, NYU School of Law and we would like to say that we firmly believe that human rights not only provide a necessary perspective for assessing the consequences of the emergency, but also provide fundamental tools for finding timely, fair, equitable, and sustainable solutions for it. So thank you for listening to me for so long. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda. Such a complete and like very exciting and I'm sorry, I don't I don't listen to everything. Do you I think I think you are so important yeah. aspects of the advisory review. Oh, can you guys listen to me now? Yeah, now, now you're... Uh, now, yeah, yeah, but before, sorry, I didn't listen. I no problem, no problem, you have to listen, so no, no worries. So, uh, as I was saying, one of the most uh, uh, important and relevant aspects of the advisory opinion raised by the governments of Colombia and Chile was the issue of the scope of the obligation of states in regards to climate change. 
And I believe that in this world, in this world scope, in this world, uh, in this world scope, we can understand uh, many types of obligations, including the obligations uh, towards minority groups and vulnerable populations. And you you mentioned that Latinas Latinas for Climate is an organization made entirely by women. So in this regard, I would like to know to know from you: Are women mo more vulnerable to climate change? than men? If yes, why? Could you please explain to us why uh, climate change is more dangerous, more risky, risky to women than to men? Yes, yes, Ron. thank you for your question. <laughs> uh, so the United Nations Development Program has already actually recognized that the, cl the climate crisis just like nearly every other humanitarian and development challenge, has a greater, greater impact on women. According to the UN itself, this happens because of the unequal sharing of power between, between women and men, the gender gap in access to education and employment opportunities, for example, the unpaid care burden that women have, the existing gender-based violence that we suffer, and all other forms of deep-rooted gender-based discrimination in general. Women have a special vulnerability to climate change that goes beyond the biological vulnerabilities, including cultural and social vulnerability, vulner vulnerabilities as well. That's why we like to, to say that we have a, a intersectional perspective when it comes to, uh, to climate justice. And according to the, U, to the Women UN, across the world, women depend more on natural resources and yet have less access to them. In many regions, women bear a disproportionate responsibility for securing food, water, and fuel even. Agriculture is the most important employment sector for women in low-income countries and during periods of drought, and erratic rainfall, women as agricultural workers work harder to secure income and resources and resources for their families. This adds pressure on girls, for example, who often have to leave school to have to help their mothers uh, to manage the increased burden. It is important to stress that the UN recognizes that as climate change drives conflict across the planet, women and girls faced, face increased vulnerabilities to all forms of gender-based violence, including conflict-related sexual violence, human trafficking, child marriage, and other forms of, of violence. In this context, one of the reports from the United Nations on migration highlighted that 80%, which is a lot, of those displaced by climate-related phenomena are women and girls. And as climate migrants, these women and girls suffer more because of their intersectional vulnerabilities. Therefore, we also believe it is extremely necessary to fight climate change through the lens of intersectional ecofeminism, considering the way in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. It is clear that climate change risks are potentialized for indigenous and Afro-descendant women and girls, LGBTQ plus community, women and girls with disabilities, migrant women, as I mentioned, among other vulnerable groups. And we as Latinos for Climate, we firmly believe that there is no climate justice without social and gender justice. And, there's, and that's the reason why we continue to seek, like I said, to promote an, an intersectional and eco-feminist perspective on climate justice, justice by raising awareness of the inequalities that we face. And basically it is a fact that in order to fight climate, climate change, we need to tackle structural inequalities, not just between men and women, but inequalities that persist because of race, class, age, sexuality and gender as well and that's our answer <laughs> thanks a lot amanda such a complete and very interesting answer i guess that intersectionality is one of the key 
concerns when it comes to not only climate change, but human rights problems in general. So we have to put in that into account. And yeah, in, in order to continue with the, in, uh, in this debate about intersectionality and in environmental concerns, uh, I'd like to invite Patricio to ask you the third question. Patricio, are you there? Yes, uh, thank you, Joao. <laughs> well, uh, related to this uh, last question, I wanted uh, to, to ask you uh, more uh, specifically about the role of women as uh, human rights defenders and specifically uh, as environmental defenders. Uh, well, as we know, it's been widely recognized that human rights defenders and environmental defenders are key figures uh, in the protection uh, of human rights and environmental rights and, well, in uh, achieving climate justice. And this was even recognized by the Inter-American Court in, 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 in its case law, uh, more recently in the Barahona Brai v. Chile case. Uh, so, and, and, and it's also one of the questions that the uh, Chile and Colombia are um, uh, asking uh, the Inter-American Court in this advisory opinion. Uh, so I wanted to ask you what, what is the role of uh, female environmental defenders and what actions uh, should states uh, take to protect them, and particularly, um, which is a question that I think is particularly important for a region, considering uh, how dangerous sometimes being an environmental defender is uh, in some countries. So, Yes, thank you, Patricia, for your question. It is very important and uh, interesting. And we have to say that according to our partner organization as well, Impodera Clima, uh, which is a very uh, interesting and empower empowered organization as well, it is important to remember that women are not just victims of climate change, but also an important representation of strength for the solution of this global issue. Women, and especially Black and indig Indigenous women, must be present in decision-making environments at the local, regional, national, and global levels. Environmental defenders uh, or environmental human rights defenders are individuals and groups who strive to protect and promote human rights relating to the environment by protecting the environment itself, and are very important in this whole um, movement, like Patricio said. They are the front line in the non-violent defense of nature for community, indigenous living, and for the present and the future generations. And we, as Latinas for Climate, uh, we see the female, the female environmental defenders as essential agents of change, yet faced with mar marginalization, discrimination, sexism and gender-based violence. In this context, it is important to point out that the ECO 92, 92 yes, 92, is the first forum, uh, a UN conference uh, in which feminist entities had institutional visibility and influence in the preparation of documents, recognizing the reality of women, as we, as we already said, as especially vulnerable to environmental degradation, and at the same time, as agents of change. In 1995, the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing had, one of, had as one of its guidelines, women and the environment, with recommendations and objectives encompassing the feminist aspect of ecology as essential part of the framework for promoting sustainable de development. And the Beijing Plus 25 declaration in 2020, 2020 intensifies the commitment to integrate the gender perspective agenda in environmental policies. In turn, the United Nations General Assembly in 1998 adopted the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders, clar clarifying in its Article 1 that human rights defenders are all those people who individually or in asso association with others promote fight, promote and fight actually for the pro protection and realization of these rights and fundamental freedoms at national and international levels. And the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, with its gender action plan 
for 2015 to 2020, is the first to bring together gender actions under environmental convention and calls on countries to include a specific activities to fight gender inequalities and allocate adequate funding for gender mainstreaming efforts. And in Latin America, uh, as Patricia, Patricia said, we have many difficulties and it is important to stress that we have now uh, the Escazú Agreement, uh, which was adapt, adopted by the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. And this was the first human rights treaty, uh, regional human rights treaty on environmental issues to, pro to include provisions on human rights defenders in environmental matters and their rights. Such an agreement is very important for the interpretation of states' obligations by the bodies of the inter-American system. Since the 15 states that ratified the agreement are also member states of the Organization of the American States, and the American Convention of Human Rights allows the use of other treaties in which states are parties, such as the Escazú Agreement, for a, a parameter of interpretation, causing an effect also on the jurisprudence of the court. Article 9 is specifically important for, for us of the Escazú Agreement uh, because, it, because it establishes that defenders have the right to exercise their activities in a safe environment without threats, restrictions, or insecurities. In particular, defenders have the right to freely exercise access rights, such as rights to environmental information, public participation in environmental decision making, and access to environmental to an access to contribute to a more democratic and sustainable society. In addition, all threats, intimidations, and attacks that defenders suffer should be investigated with due diligence. And we, as Latinas for Climate, we believe that the empowerment of women and the application of ecofeminism are consolidated as essential elements to environmental protection. As I already said, as I already said, and I would like to, to um, reinforce, as a way to mitigate damage, strengthen autonomy and, man and maintenance of rights while developing experiences of environmental recovery. And the UN itself stresses the importance of a gender responsive approach in bringing to light stories and amplifying voices of environmental women human rights defenders, thus advancing their legitimacy in society and raising public awareness on the gendered nature of environmental rights violations. According to the organization Frontline Defenders, Brazil is one of the countries that kills the most human rights defenders in the world, behind only Colombia, Ukraine, and Mexico, in that order. It appears that in the Americas, there are endemic levels of impunity, like Patricia stressed, combined with limited access to justice, persistent and violent attacks, harassment, and forced displacement with the aim of promoting commercial interests. So it is also no noteworthy that defenders who work with the land, environment, and rights of indigenous peoples were the most targeted in 2022, representing 48% of murders around the world. In 2021, International Service for Human Rights Organization, Amnesty International, and a few other feminist organizations brought virtually together 45 women, human rights defenders from many countries as Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Honduras, Colombia, Chile, and many others, engaged in the defense of the right to land, territory, environment, water, and indigenous rights. And regarding this, um, this project, um, we would like to say that the actions that should be taken by states that to protect these women, these hu human rights defenders, besides the compliance by states of the leg legislative framework aforementioned, Latinas for Climate agrees 
that the with the demands made by this 45 women interviewed who demand the UN and the international community the following uh, the following the following uh, the following affirmations and demands basically they demand to take action against states to continue to allow in that they, they demand to take action against states that continue to allow impunity for hundreds of killings of environmental human rights defenders. They recognize that the criminal justice system is used sometimes as a tool of repression against human rights defenders. And they, they demand we join in their calls that those detained arbitrarily or solely for defending human rights must be released and false charges must be dropped. They demand governments and business to act respectively and always extensively consult and listen to communities instead of imposing extractive and damaging mega projects on them, including those that are supposed to be considered as green projects, sustainable projects, because they lead to displacement, destruction, violence in the communities, including sexual violence against women and girls. And they also call out those states that are introducing laws to shrink their rights to freedom of, of expression, association, assembly, which are essential tools in their work as defenders and cannot be taken away. And they demand uh, the states to develop strong tools to bring to account business enterprises who abuse their rights and ensure they are not financed. They call to urgently protect and promote women human rights defenders and end stigmatization, hate campaigns, and digital attacks against them. They also provide, they, they also demand the states to provide flexible resources for women human rights defenders and their organizations. And at last, they demand the states to promote public policies focused on the recognition and redistribu redist red redistribution of the burden of domestic and care work and encourage a more equitable participation in public spaces and decision-making process by women human rights defenders. And that's it. <laughs> Well, thank you. Very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, I think it, indeed it's it's really important to, yeah, to 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 implement public policies that address these impunity issues and like the use of criminal justice uh, systems uh, to to oppress the work of like uh, uh, of human rights defenders and particularly female human rights defenders. I think it's yeah, it's it's really really important thing to to do. And well, in in that in in that. Um, sense, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, the, our, our last question uh, with respect specifically to the advisory opinion issued by uh, Chile and Colombia. Um, well, so far the inter-American system uh, is, let's say the, 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 the most advanced system uh, among the other regional systems of human rights uh, with respect to the right to environment, uh, thanks to uh, the advisory, the previous advisory opinion on, 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 on the right to a healthy environment. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to ask you why, uh, why in your opinion, is, uh, if this uh, new advisory opinion is uh, necessary, um, what does uh, the current case law uh, on the right to a healthy environment lack? Uh, so yeah, I wanted to, to ask you that. Thank you again for your question. Um, and I can say that today we can find in jurisprudence cases regarding the violations of the right to dignified living the right, to, the right of non refoulement in the international refugee law, among other rights that have been considered violated in the context, uh, have been considered violated by international courts in the context of other environmental violations, failures to address climate change made by states. For example, uh, as you mentioned, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has expressed itself on several occasions for the protection of the environment uh, as a condition for dignified living, as well as access to and quality of water, food, and health. 
These conditions significantly impact the right to a dignified existence in general and the basic conditions for the exercise of other human rights. Does the lack of access to these conditions, according to the Inter-American uh, Inter Court of Human Rights, may even include a violation of the right to personal integrity. Therefore, states must adopt, according to the court, an appropriate normative framework that prevents any threat to dignified life, as well as safeguard the right to access to conditions that grant guarantee a life with dignity. In particular, uh, in 2017, uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights issued an advisory opinion, also mentioned by Patricio, at the request of the Republic of Colombia to address the link between the environment and human rights. In that opinion, the court stressed, among other things, that provided that there is a, ca there is a causal link, states must protect human rights if they're affected by environmental harm, even outside their own territory. It also recognized the right to a healthy environment as an autonomous right, despite not being included in the American Convention of Human Rights. Moreover, it is necessary to point out uh, the decision of the UN Human Rights Committee on the case Teitiota, I don't know if I pronounce it right, but Teitiota versus New Zealand, uh, which was much celebrated because for the first time, an international body has recognized that non-delivery obligations, uh, that is the principle of non refoulement in the international refugee law, may apply in the event of the expulsion of people uh, that may be exposed, that, uh, sorry, may apply in the event that the expulsion of people may expose them to violations of the right to life or against torture, cruel, torture, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment for the effects of climate change. That is, if the lives, if their lives are in danger in their country of origin or in the country or in a third country which they may be sent to because of climate change, the principle of non refoulement applies. That's the decision of the UN uh, Human Rights Committee. Furthermore, the decision acknowledged that uh, the decision acknowledged that this last decision acknowledged that the risk of entire nations being completely co covered by water is also so extreme that living conditions in these countries may become incomfortable, incomfortable with the right to again, a dignified life before the risk even materializes. More recently in September, 2022, the UN Human Rights Committee, again, in the case of Daniel Billy versus Australia found that Australia's failure to adequately protect indigenous tourist islanders against adverse, adverse impacts of climate change violated their rights to enjoy their culture and be free from arbitrary interferences in their lives, in their lives and their family lives and their home. This outcome from the committee could help define the consequences of climate change in terms of for forced migration which is a huge problem nowadays. So these are a few highlights from the case law on climate change. But when it comes to the advisory opinions from the courts, uh, it is important to observe that there is not only the advisory opinion on climate emergency from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on the table, uh, but we are also, but there is also the one from the International Tribunal of the Law and the Sea requested from some uh, small island states while simultaneously seeking support at the UN General Assembly for a similar proceeding uh, before the International Court of Justice as well. So therefore, we are expecting from these international bodies a few important responses in terms of interpretation of states' obligations regarding the climate emergency. And we believe that the, the advisory opinion from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights can assess the precise nature of the principle of common but differentiated responsibility in the scope of international human rights law, especially considering the case of states that have not historically contributed to the climate emergency, but are still vulnerable to its impacts. And sometimes, let's be honest, are the most vulnerable ones. <laughs> 
as it is the case of the Caribbean nations, for example. Common but differentiated responsibilities in general terms is a principle of international environmental law establishing that all states are responsible for addressing global environmental issues or destruction, yet they're not equally responsible. In addition to this, in addition, in addition, this interpretation by the advisory opinion in the light of common but differentiated responsibility brings the possibility of recognizing the nations with major carbon emissions as responsible as responsible to mitigate in the countries most affected by climate change, which could relate to the already recognized by the court obligation aforementioned that states must protect human rights if they're affected by environmental harm, even outside their territory. Another thing we, we might expect from the opinion is the consideration of climate mitigation as a human right obligation, which implies that states could be held accountable for failing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in accordance even with their obligation, with obligations within the scope of the Paris Agreement. And by the way, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights has already defined some general guidelines on the scope of human rights and climate emergency, emphasizing on principle 15 of the resolution passed that the states must take appropriate measures to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions according to the maximum available resources. Therefore, we believe as as some other scholars do, do as, as well, that this advisory opinion from the court on climate emergency could promote international law innovations, particularly in the interpretation of human rights obligations concerning due diligence and common but differentiated responsibilities. It is also the opportunity for the, of, of the court to focus on the state's obligations regarding environmental defenders protection as we were as we were uh, we were mentioning its importance especially indigenous people and women taking into account the american convention and the skazu agreement and that's our answer <laughs> thank you for listening thank you thank you very much for your answer very very interesting uh, i think it's very interesting, specifically the uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, and would be quite interesting. Uh, ho hopefully, the court will also uh, take that into consideration when they issue this uh, this advisory opinion. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you are uh, muted, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. I can listen to you. Yeah, sorry, sorry, everyone. Uh, Amanda, thank you immensely for for your for your words, for your explanation, for your time to be here today. Uh, yeah, everything was so well explained, so well grounded uh, by your words, and you do have a really solid background on, on environmental law, and it's such a pleasure to to have you today with us. And yeah, for the for the the ones who are watching the the video. Uh, Thank you for your time. I hope you got interested about the the work of the of the Inter American Court a little bit, and also about the the work of Latinos Latinos for Climate. Uh, among the work, uh, people can find more information about Latinos for Climate. Do you guys are are you guys on social media on uh, LinkedIn, maybe Instagram? Yes, we are on Instagram, and there we have also our website. It's actually, let me just make sure I don't say it wrong, <laughs> but it's just Latinos for Climate is it's our account. Yeah, I guess people may find you uh, with a quick search in Google. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for being here. And for the ones who are watching, uh, stay tuned for the next videos of the GHD YouTube channel. Bye-bye. Thank you guys. Thank you a lot. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.